failed to make the announcement earlier in the service that the youth would be meeting tonight at the normal time. Is that correct, Barry? And uh, Miss Edie, are y'all meeting tonight? No, the children are not meeting tonight, but the youth are meeting this evening at the normal time. It's now time for our children to be dismissed to Children's Church, children ages 4 through 8. This is your opportunity to go to separate activities for your age group. Miss Lily, that is a beautiful outfit you have on. That is gorgeous. I love that. You look good too. You look good too. As do you, Miss Abby. All our children, I love the smile on their faces as they come down the aisle every morning. You know, it's so good to, to, to see such vibrant young people. And this morning, it's so good to see Betty and Warren back with us. Betty's been, not been feeling well in recent months, but Betty, we love you. Warren, we love you both. We're glad you're here. So thankful you're able to be with us today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Of course, we don't intend to slight anybody. We're always glad. For, I know there's several people here that perhaps not been with us in some time. Welcome back to, to your home, Buffalo Baptist Church. See if this uh, story resonates with any of you. Let me first ask this question. How many of you still have shopping left to do? The majority of us in this room. <laughs> the majority of us in this room. How many of you are last minute Christmas shoppers? How many of you have repented of that sin every year and, and failed to, <laughs> to turn from it? But I'll give you an example of the frenzy that goes with that. I, 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 I jokingly said on Facebook the other day that now that we're about two weeks or so from Christmas, it's time for me to start planning my last-minute panic shopping trip, which is usually what ends up being a panic shopping. I, to this day, I have no idea what to get baby girl for Christmas, and uh, I want to get that perfect gift uh, because she is the perfect wife. Uh, amen. Amen. I thought I'd get a better, a better, <laughs> but obviously I understand why, particularly you men don't want to say yes, you're right, because y'all's wives are, in y'all's mind, the perfect wife, as they should be, as they should be, but uh, I'm, I'm going to get back on the track where I'm supposed to be here this morning before I get any more trouble than I'm already in. Typical of last minute Christmas shoppers, a, a young mother was out, she was in the mall, frantically going down her list, trying to get all the, the presents that she knew she needed to purchase for Christmas. And of course, when you're focused on Christmas shopping, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to maintain focus on anything else. And she's out there trying her best, but she's, she's in this mall, then suddenly she realized something was wrong. That little hand that she'd been holding the entire Christmas tr shopping trip was no longer in her hand, the hand of her three-year-old child in the mall. Now you can imagine the, the fear that went into her, her mind and fear that went into, into her, her, her heart as she realized that in this busy mall filled with all these frenzied, last-minute, hurried Christmas shoppers, her little three-year-old son was no longer with her. Well, panicking, she started to, to look and run around to one store and another, asking people, have you seen the little boy? Have you seen the little boy? He, he's wearing such and such. I, I, I lost him. He's found him. And then suddenly she realizes, she sees him. He's up in, in, in this window front, a, a window display of one of the department stores. And, and, and she, he had his little pudgy nose pressed up against the window, looking in at a manger scene. And she calls out, and she says, Son, I've been looking everywhere for you. And he turns around and says, Mommy, did you see? It's baby Jesus in a manger. Joy in his eyes as he saw the little representation of baby Jesus. Joy. Joy. And in that moment, she remembered what Christmas was supposed to be a season of joy. A season of joy. Today is the third Sunday of Advent. We're working our way through. One more Sunday of Advent and then Christmas will be here. Aren't you glad it's getting closer? 
Aren't you glad the season's upon us? One of the songs of this time of year that often is sung, I'm not going to sing it, but the lyrics say this, a candle is burning, a candle of joy, a candle to welcome brave Mary's new boy. Our hearts fill with wonder, our eyes light and glow, as joy brightens winter, winter like sunshine on snow. First Sunday of Advent, we lit the first candle, which represented Christmas being a season of hope. Last Sunday, we lit the second candle, representing that Christmas to be a, a season of peace. Today, we light the third candle, the rose-colored candle, to show us and to represent that Christmas to be a season a season of joy. We bow me in prayer. Father God, this is a time of year that our focus is to be restored to where it should be year-round. Father, this is a season that if we contemplate on the advent, the first advent of your Son, the coming second advent, when He will come again, we can have hope. We can have peace we can and should have joy. Father, today I pray that as we examine Scripture and listen to the Word that You've given to me, help us to remember and to, to somehow make a determination in our own lives that we will live lives of joy this season. Make us ones, Father, who by word and action Bring praise and glory and honor to you through your Son. It's in His name we pray. Amen. Joy at Christmas time. Joy at Christmas time. Many of the hymns that we sing, many of the carols which are sung, speak to that joy. How many of y'all are willing to help your pastor this morning? You don't know what I'm going to ask you, but I'm going to ask you, are you willing to help me? Because I want joy to fill this room. And the only way joy can fill this room is if indeed I am given some help. So on cue, join with me. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till He appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope the weary soul rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Oh, hear the angel voice. Oh, night divine. Oh, night when Christ was born. Christ is born in 
This is a season of joy. Amen. Amen. For those of you watching at home and on the internet, I wish y'all could have heard the congregation and not merely me. It was beautiful in this room. It was beautiful in this room. And Arnold, this is one reason I waited till after you gave the Christmas presents before I led in song today. But Christmas, a season of joy. A season of joy. There's one big idea I want you to take home today. If you remember nothing else, remember this. Christmas is about declaring joy to the world. The Lord has come. Amen? It's about declaring joy to the the world. The Lord has come. And we sing about joy. We preach about joy. We read about joy. We hang ornaments that say joy, etc. And God desires that His people will be full of joy. That is one of God's desires. He wants you and I to be full of joy. And this morning, we're going to consider three ways which I believe Scripture encourages us to truly embrace and experience joy this Christmas season. I'm going to ask if you would to turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. This morning I'll be reading just a few verses from this very familiar Christmas narrative. A narrative that you've heard, read many times, preached on, teached on. You've heard songs that have their basis in this. We, many of your families will read this around the Christmas tree on Sunday morning or Sunday evening. Uh, this is the passage that, that is, is per- perhaps the most widely known of the Christmas passages. This story of, of Christ's coming and the proclamation when Jesus was born in Bethlehem and how the angels appeared to the shepherds out in the fields and, and told them, There's this wonderful news about the Christ child, the Messiah, the Anointed One being delivered. And they're the ones to first receive that news. And then they made their way to Bethlehem. They they found that manger and they found that child just as was told to them. But tomorrow we'll look at a portion of that. I'm going to ask if you're willing and able to stand with us as we honor God's Word this morning. Luke chapter 2. We'll be reading just a few verses at this point. Luke chapter 2. Verses 8 through 11. From the New American Standard Bible it reads, In the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news of great what? Great joy which will be for all the people. 
For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. We'll pause there. May God add His blessings to the reading and hearing of His Word. You may be seated. You may be seated. Back during the 2008 presidential race, John McCain, the candidate for the Republican uh, ticket that year, was asked by Time magazine to share his personal journey of faith. And some of you know John McCain. You know of him. He's a name you've heard. You may not be too familiar with back. He's a longtime senator from the state of Arizona. Before that, he was a military man. He, he was a pilot. He was shot down in, during the Vietnam War. He was imprisoned in North Vietnam. And in, in the article this, that re- spoke of this interview that Time Magazine had with Senator McCain, he shared a powerful story of something that occurred while he was a prisoner in North Vietnam. I'll just quote from him. Senator McCain says, When I was a prisoner of war in Vietnam, my captors would tie my arms behind my back and then loop the rope around my neck and ankles so that my head was pulled down between my knees. I was often like that throughout the night. One night, a guard came into my cell. He put his fingers to his lips, signaling for me to be quiet, and then loosened my ropes to relieve my pain. The next morning, when his shift ended, the guard returned and retightened the ropes, never saying a word to me. A month or so later, on Christmas Day, I was standing in the dirt courtyard when I saw that same guard approach me. He walked up and stood silently next to me, not looking or even smiling at me. Then he used his sandaled foot to draw a cross in the dirt. He says, we stood wordlessly looking at the cross remembering the true light of Christmas, even in the darkness of a Vietnamese prison camp. End of quote. We said this is a season of joy. The question is, what are you doing to find joy this Christmas season? What are you doing to find joy this Christmas season? And if you are relying on the world or on your personal circumstances to find joy, then you're very likely to be left feeling cold and lonely. So what is joy? What is joy? If we're going to find joy, we have to define what it is. What is it that that, that we need to find about joy during this Christmas season? Of course, I would encourage you to turn to your Bible. Define what is joy. What is joy? What's the true definition, if you would, of joy? How can I experience joy? How do I I find joy in this troubled world that's out there? So I went to do a a study of joy in the Bible, and and if you look in the concordance or any good reference edition that points out where you can find words in the Bible, joy is roughly found between 600 and 650 times mentioned in the Bible. Now, obviously, this is not just the word joy, but words such as joy, or rejoice, or rejoicing, or glad, gladness, and delight. All these things that tie into joy, somewhere around 600 to 650 times we find different passages speaking of joy in the Bible. For instance, in Psalm chapter 5, verse 11, we learn that God wants us to rejoice, to shout for joy, and to be joyful. Psalm chapter 43, verse 4, the psalmist calls his God exceeding joy. He says that God is exceeding joy. In Job chapter 8, verse 21, in fact, five times in Job, we learn that God will fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. Matthew chapter 25, verse 21, heaven is called the joy of the Lord. In Acts chapter 13, verse 52, the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. In Romans chapter 14, verse 17, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. And in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, Paul tells us that joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit. There's, there's these uh, 
uh, nine fruits of the Spirit that every Christian has. When the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts, we get these fruits. Now, people want to say, well, I don't have the certain gifts, and God only gives through His Spirit certain gifts to certain people. Certain gifts to certain people. We don't all have the same gifts. But if we're a child of God, redeemed by Him through faith, saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have the fruit of the Spirit in our life, and joy is one of those. Amen? So if you are a Christian, stop sulking about what's going wrong this year and start praising God because He's in your life this year. Amen? Joy! Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. It's something we all should have. And, and, and God has put it there. Some of us have tried to wrap it up and tie it and hide it up. You know, uh, 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 put a prisoner in some deep corner of our soul. But God wants that thing to burst forth in our lives. We see joy all through the Bible. We see joy in the Christmas story. In Luke chapter 1, verse 14, Zechariah was told by the angel, you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. In Luke 1, 44, John the Baptist leaped for joy inside his mother's womb when he heard the voice of Mary. In Luke 1, 47, Mary rejoiced in God her Savior, even though she has given this very frightful news. In Luke chapter 1, 58, we see that they were rejoicing with Elizabeth. Luke chapter 2, verse 10, one of the verses we just read, the angel from on high proclaimed glad tidings of great joy. So we see all these references and more of joy in the Bible. But again, what is joy? How is it shown in our lives? How is it manifest? How is it, how is it revealed through us to a world that so much needs joy? Well, if you go back to the Old Testament and look at people who are filled with joy, we see all kinds of things they're doing. They're dancing, they're leaping, they're spinning around in pleasure, intense motion. It's a time where the inward joy is outwardly manifest for the world to see. Amen? Amen? And the world is obvious when somebody is filled with joy. In the New Testament, we see that joy results in celebration. You know, people are celebrating this joy they have in Christ. Joy they have in Christ. Now, now for those of y'all that are here, y'all have heard me say this before. For those on the internet, same thing. But I want to repeat it. Is there a difference between joy and happiness? And yes, there is. There's a difference between joy and happiness. What is happiness? Happiness is being uh, satisfied with, with, with what's going on in your life. Happiness is based on the circumstances of your life. Happiness is based on the circumstances of your life. Right now, right now, if my brother Barry would come out here and, and give me a, a, a crisp hundred dollar bill, I'd be very happy. No, <laughs> okay, you know, I'd be very happy if he was to do that. If, if Barry was to come out here and kick me in the shin, I would not be very happy. Happiness is based on circumstance. Barry can deliver either good a good day or a bad day to me. You know, he could do one or the other. So can, happiness is based on circumstances. But if Barry was to come out and kick me in my shin, and I would not be very happy about it, would I still have joy in my life? Yes, if I focus on Christ, if I allow Christ to work in me. Joy is based on a relationship, not on circumstances. Joy is something that's integral. Not, the world can't change that. The world can't take it away. The world can't diminish it unless we allow them to. Amen? Joy is something we choose to be. We choose to be joyful because God is in us. His Son's alive in us. His Spirit has filled us. We have the joy that only Christ can give and nobody can take that away. Amen? Amen? Somebody get up and shout for me. Do something. You know, you know, joy. Joy. That's what God wants. Nowhere in the Bible does God, does it say, I should say, that God wants His people to be sad or depressed. But many times we see He wants us to be filled with joy. The psalmist says it like this in Psalm 30 verse 5. Weeping may endure for a night but joy comes in the morning. Amen? Again, the big idea today, Christmas is about declaring joy to the world. Joy to the world. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. God's desire is that His people be full of joy.
So let's talk about how can we be full of joy? How can we experience God? Three ways. These are within the context of your bulletin. I would encourage you to take notes, fill in the blanks, write down anything else you sense God is saying to you. Three ways to experience the joy of Christmas. Number one, find joy in the worship of Jesus. Find joy in the worship of Jesus. Earlier in the Christmas narrative, Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, the, the Magi, the wise men from the east said, Where is He who has been born King of the Jews? For we have seen His star in the east and have come to do what? Worship Him. Worship Him. These are not even Jews. These are not Jews. They have, they have nothing to do with the Jewish race or, 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 or population. These are people that came from a far distance. It took them about two years to travel, we understand, to get there. They came from a long way off. They had nothing to do with, with the, the, the political kingdom of Israel or, or any of its citizenship or anything like that. But they came, they knew there was something special about that babe that was born. And they came to worship. They came to worship. They went to great extent to worship the king. They went to great extent to travel through hardship because they wanted to worship Jesus. This year, this summer, or this December, your calendar is filled with activities. Am I right? There's a lot going on. Our church calendar is full. Your school calendars are full. Your family calendars are full. There's a lot going on. People, take the time, the effort, the energy to go not just to participate in activities, but to worship Jesus Christ. Amen? Worship Jesus Christ. If you want to get that, that, that peak of joy in your life, you must worship Jesus. The psalmist says, talking about God, says you are holy. You're enthroned in the praises of Israel. Psalm 16, verse 11 says, In your presence, O Lord, is fullness of joy. In fullness of joy. And we gather together as people that are brought together by a common bond of a relationship in Jesus Christ. When we worship the King, when we come into His presence, it is there that we find joy. It's there that we find joy. Matthew chapter 2, verse 10, the Magi rejoiced exceedingly with great joy when they came in the presence of the newborn King. We must rejoice exceedingly with great joy when we come to worship the King. Amen? Point number two, find joy in communion with Jesus. Find joy in communion with Jesus. What do I mean by communion? I'm talking about fellowship. I'm talking about relationship. There's this deep, intimate, personal relationship with Jesus. This deep, personal, intimate relationship with Jesus. That's what I mean by communion with Jesus. Matthew chapter 1, 23 says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean? God with us. God with us. Jesus said later on in His earthly ministry in John chapter 15, as a part of His, His farewell discourse, He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in Me and I in Him bears much fruit. For without Me you can do nothing. If you abide in Me and My words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Jesus is saying if we maintain that close relationship with Him, young people maintain that personal relationship with Jesus. If we truly turn to Him, don't worry about what our friends at school say. Don't worry about what the other kids say or what the world is saying. Don't pay attention to those nuts on social media who try to discredit Jesus Christ. If we maintain that personal relationship with Him, then we can have that joy that comes only through Him. And in fact, joy does only come through Jesus. Amen? Jesus is the reason. Jesus is the way we get that joy, that relationship with Him. With Him. When we spend time with the King, 
When we spend time with Jesus, we invest ourselves, our lives in Him, we experience that fullness of joy that Jesus says we can have. So find joy in the worship of Jesus. Find joy in communion with Jesus. Finally, find joy in living for Jesus. Amen? Joy in living for Jesus. Matthew 1.21 says, And she will bring forth a son, And you shall call His name Jesus, for He will save His people from their sins. What does Jesus mean? Anybody know? We talked about Emmanuel means God with us. You might know what Jesus means? Jesus is the New Testament or the Greek equivalent of the Old Testament name Joshua. Everybody remember Joshua? The one who succeeded Moses? The one who led the people of Israel across the the, uh, Jordan River and into the Promised Land? After the 40 years of wandering in the desert, Joshua's name meant something. Jesus' name means something. Most or all, as best I can tell, biblical names have a meaning. Joshua means the same thing as Jesus, or Jesus means the same thing as Joshua. And it literally means Yahweh saves, or God saves. God saves. And that's what Jesus is all about. Jesus is God, sent in human flesh to die on that cross so that we could live. God saves. Amen. Jesus saves. Jesus came to save us from our sins. And and therefore we should live with Him. Remember that song we sang a while ago? O holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till He appeared and the soul felt its worth. Let's focus on that. Long lay the world in sin and error pining. Pining. What in the world is pining? That, that, that sounds like a word I didn't know what it was. I, I, I had a man at my first church, John. You remember John? His wife, Frankie. Uh, I, I don't, John, if you're listening on this, I don't think you'll mind me telling him so. I apologize. But John Garns, his name, he's from East Tennessee. His, his, his family, or he had to move to North Carolina because his job changed locations. He worked in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, and he was now in the Durham, North Carolina area. His, his uh, children and grandkids and all that were back in East Tennessee. Frankie, his wife, she was a homemaker. She didn't work outside the house. Well, she'd go back to Tennessee and spend quite a bit of time with her children and grandchildren, leaving John over in North Carolina to go to work. And, and, and John came to me, and one time he, uh, his wife had been gone to East Tennessee for several weeks, and he says, I sure am pining for... I sure am pining for uh, Frankie. It was her name for Frankie. I said, John, what in the world is pining? What? You, you scholars up here, what does pining mean? Y'all have any idea? It, it, what, what, all the old folks knew. Excuse me. All those that are older than y'all. <laughs> you know, but, but it's a longing. It's a deep longing. It, it, it's a, 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 an intense Desire, an intense desire. But what that song say? Long lay the world in sin and error pining till He appeared and the soul felt its worth. When you have that deep, intense longing for something, pining, the true definition is, is to fail gradually in health or vitality from grief, regret, or longing. So what the song is saying is, we need you, God. Our health is failing. We're we're, we're crumbling before You, wanting that presence that only Jesus can give us. We want that presence that only Jesus can give. Do you have that kind of longing for Jesus? Oh man, I hope you do. I hope I do. Every day when I wake up, I hope that I have this, this urge to spend more time with Jesus than I ever have before. I want to pine for Jesus uh, to, to have that kind of longing. But at the same token, He's right there with me. Amen? He's right there with me. He's in me. He's living. He's all around me. He is there. He is there. Listen to what the psalmist says in Psalm 32. Oh, what joy for those whose rebellion is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sin, I was weak and miserable. 
and I groaned all day long. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide them, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all you who obey Him. Shout for joy, all you whose hearts are pure. End of the verse there. We need to submit to the King. Amen? We need to turn to Him. We need to rebuild that relationship with Him. We need to turn from our sin and embrace the love that He gives us and the, this forgiveness that He offers to us. We need to submit to the King to confess and forsake our sin if, if, if we want to ever experience the joy of the kingdom. That's what it's all about. Amen? We want to experience joy. They close with this. Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice in the Lord always. So this Christmas, let's worship the King. Let's spend time with the King, commune with the King. And let's submit our lives to the King. And then we will experience the joy of the kingdom. Amen? Let me close with this. This thought. I told you all that I still have Christmas shopping to do and that it's hard for me to pick out a present for baby girl. How many of y'all have in your family somebody who's hard to buy for? You'll relate to this. I'm not going to give a name, but there is a person among our relatives. It's not baby girl. It's not baby girl. But somebody that we have to buy a Christmas present for every year. We exchange Christmas presents at the appropriate time. I've been married to baby girl for 22 years. And in that time, we've exchanged Christmas presents with this particular relative. This particular relative. I cannot remember a single solitary time out of those 22 Christmases we've spent together that we purchased a present for this particular relative that they did not, on December 26th, take back to the store in exchange for something else. Some of y'all are laughing because you think it's you. <laughs> Every single stinking year, we go out there trying our best to find a present that will satisfy this particular relative. And sure enough, the day after Christmas, they're going to take it back. So I finally told baby girl this. I said, baby girl, I said, I want you to decide how much you're going to spend on this particular relative. Whatever it is, $10, $25, $50, whatever you want to spend, pick it out. Get your dollar amount set. Walk into a department store. The very first thing you see on any of the shelves in any of the sections of the store, if it meets your price range, purchase that. I don't care if it's men's clothing, women's clothing. <laughs> pet supplies or hardware, it doesn't matter. This relative is going to take it back anyway and exchange it for something they would prefer. You know how it makes me feel when I spend hours and hours and hours shopping for somebody, trying to pick out a present for them that I think they would like, and they the very next day Take it back. They reject the present that I purchased them. This Christmas season, God has given every one of us the present of Jesus Christ. And in this room, there are probably people in this room who would rather take Jesus and exchange Jesus for the ways of the world, for popularity or fame, for power, prestige, or just for 
anything in the world. They'd rather have anything over Jesus. Young people, if you choose anything at all over Jesus, you are rejecting Jesus. You are rejecting God. You are rejecting God. He has given you the perfect gift. The perfect gift. He's ready for you to accept that gift and to live a life filled with joy. Don't try to take it back and exchange it for something else. Accept that gift. Father God, help us this Christmas season to embrace that gift of salvation you've given us through Jesus. Help us to gladly and unashamedly and even boldly proclaim joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. Father God, let that song begin deep within our soul. Let it resonate from our hearts. Manifest itself in our lives. May that joy just ooze from us, O oh Lord, like a never-ending fountain. A fountain, O oh Lord, that comes from Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning as we sing this hymn of invitation, it's time for some of you in this room